Our next speaker is Bert Weeks. Bert previously worked for the Nature Conservancy in Hawaii, supporting community-based conservation. He came to the MAS program to broaden his understanding of conservation, which now includes knowledge about science, from high up in the atmosphere to the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean, and policy from the local, national, and international scale. After the MAS program, he's going to take the knowledge and resources gained at Scripps back to Hawaii through a Sussman Fellowship to restore wetlands in his hometown in Pearl Harbor. The title of Bert's presentation today is Mosaics for the Masses, Using 3D Reef Modeling Technology to Empower Communities in Micronesia. Well, my name is Bert Weeks. Uh, thank you all for being here, and we're like really close to beers, so I, I really hope that uh, you, you pay attention. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I purposely didn't put a lot of text in because I know we were going pretty late. <laughs> Growing up in Hawaii, swimming through coral reefs was one of the favorite things that I used to do. Looking at the different colors, the intricate patterns, the shapes of these incredible animals grow into is something that fascinated me ever since I was a kid. It's one of the reasons why I decided to study marine science. However, I'm lucky. I grew up on an island surrounded by coral reefs and sometimes get to look at them for my job. Science tells us that these corals are under threat and that they need our help. But how is someone who doesn't spend their weekends underwater supposed to understand what that means, let alone believe it enough to do something about it? Three years ago, I learned about a tool that I thought might help. A handful of researchers had begun to use this tool called photogrammetry, where you take Tons of photos of a reef, put them into a fancy computer program, and out pops a super detailed 3D model of a coral reef. I thought to myself, on this, someone who's on the outset of their conservation career, this is something I'm really interested in. This is a lot of potential. I think coral reef science is going to head in this direction. I really wanted to learn how to do this. So I got a trial version of this software, went diving, uploaded some photos. It took about 10 days to process on my laptop. Um, and, but out came this incredible model. I was really blown away what I was able to do. And I could show it to my friends, and they could zoom around the reef and zoom up into it. It was really cool. And a lot of, at that time, I was working a lot with communities, helping provide science for their conservation efforts. And I thought to myself, underwater cameras are getting a lot cheaper these days. What if the people who lived right next to the reef could collect this kind of data on their own? It wasn't the easiest thing to do to make these 3D models, but you know, if I could figure this out, others could as well. But then I got stuck. Not only with thousands of photos that clogged up my computer, but because I had all these models and I didn't really know what to do with them. I could do some really basic analysis and stuff, but I didn't have the knowledge, the capacity, or the technical skill to use them in ways that would be practical to the communities that I was working with. So when I got to Scripps, I wanted to engage with the 100 Island Challenge, an initiative from the Smith and the Sandin Lab that's been using these 3D models to compare islands throughout multiple oceans and pushing the envelope and using photogrammetry in coral reefs. I was blown away with what they were able to discover about the reef and what they were able to, what they were able to do with the resources that they had, like custom software created just for them by engineers here at UCSD. But I was even more excited to learn that they had some of the same ideas that I had. They wanted to share this technology to the communities, but they were already way ahead of me in that front. They thought if you provide the, next, the necessary camera equipment and the training, partners would be able to image their reef, send their photos to scripts for processing, then Scripps could send them back this 3D model. This process removed some of the biggest technological limitations that most people would run into, like the powerful computers and custom software, resources that are available here at Scripps, but not everywhere else in the world. Teaching people a certain way to take photos is relatively easy. So if this process works, people around the world will have access and create 3D models of the reef just, just like this, just like our scientists here at Scripps can. However, there was still the problem that I had run into earlier. Once these partners had these models, what would they do with it? The lab here had come up with many ways to extract data, but without the resources and scientific training, would they still be useful to a community? We kind of thought it would be easiest to use those models for outreach and communication. That would be really good for these communities to use them for, but that brings up another set of questions like, what kind of, communi what kind of communications needs do our partners have? What are they trying to say? Of all the ways that we can show the, these models, what would help them reach their target audience? And so the best way to answer this question was to go talk with these partners. So we uh, took a trip 
over to uh, Palau. If you never know where Palau is, it's uh, on the, in the Western Pacific in a region called Micronesia, where we worked with a nonprofit called One Reef, who works with uh, communities doing community-based management throughout Palau and Micronesia. Um, in this workshop, we had three communities come. There was a uh, conservation officers from uh, Naralong, which is a, it located in the north of Palau, in Helen Reef, which is an atoll to the south of Palau, and from the Conservation Society of Pohnpei, located east in the federal, stated, federal states of Micronesia. We spent three days learning how to use the camera rigs and practicing out in the reef. And the participants were really eager to learn and really quick to pick up the skills throughout the workshop. As they gained a better understanding of how this whole process worked, they started to see how it would fit in their own work that they were doing. So while some of the members of our team were teaching people how to work this equipment, I spent most of my time talking to participants, members of the community, the dive masters, local scientists, and basically anyone else who had an opinion about coral reefs who were interested in 3D models, um, getting their input and making sure their, their voices were heard in this process. I tried to build relationships with each of the participants, knowing from previous working with communities that these relationships are the foundation to any partnership, and it's gonna be important to making this project work. I became familiar with kind of works that they were doing and wanted to know what issues each organization was addressing, and their honest opinions about the workshop, their aspirations about 3D models, and if they could see themselves using it, or if they would even use it at all. So of all the things that you can do with a 3D model, what was the thing that stood out most to our partners? That thing that they wanted to build with 3D models was trust. So why is trust the thing that they wanted to build? Why was trust the thing that they needed? With the establishment of marine protected areas and a lot of the management that's going down in Palau and Micronesia, like this place here in Narlong, there's a lot of skepticism from the community. Things like, are these preserves actually working? Do I need to follow these rules? You know, the scientists are saying that, you know, these preserves are helping to improve coral reefs, but wasn't it the scientists that establishes, that established these marine protected areas in the first place? Of course they would have seen it's working. Should I poach in this place? You know, uh, are there really impacts going on from tourism? All these kind of things. There's a lot of skepticism going on from the, the, uh, in the community. So what these conservation officers really wanted was something to bridge that trust. When I spoke to the director of Nartalong uh, Conservation Officers, he said he wanted something that he could show the community, what they were seeing on the reef. He gives presentations every week to the local community, and he wanted to say, you know, these things that we're looking at on the reef, this is what we're looking at. These are the things, these are the changes that we're seeing. Because it's one thing when you're just telling somebody, but it's another thing when you're actually showing it to themselves. It's really important that you that you verify the information that you're prov uh, providing to the community. So not only using these 3D models is important to build these trusts, but verifying that the trust, that you can trust these 3D models in the first place. So uh, overlaying these 3D models with, uh, with real life images of the reef, comparing what it looks like in the virtual world compared to what it looks like from someone's perspective that was diving, this was me taking a video, and overlaying those just even gives you a verification that this model is really what you're looking at in the first place. In addition, using these models can add another element of time because you can't really look back on a video or you can't, uh, you can look back on a video, but having a record of what the reef looked like at different time points is so much valuable, is so valuable to building trust. So what I did is I took two time points. Uh, sorry, first of all, I'm gonna show you a video on the left, which is something that I took of the reef, and the same video on the right uh, that was created within the 3D model. So you can see that, you know, this, this uh, 3D model is what you're seeing on the reef. And you can see, oh, this reef is looking pretty good. But luckily, we had this same model from two years ago. You know, that's a huge change. All this branching coral that's located, even some of that table coral that's located at the top of this reef, of this view of the reef, that's not there anymore. You wouldn't be able to see this kind of change without the use of these kind of tools. So when you're talking to somebody about the change in their reef, that's the place that they know 
theory and they don't necessarily even believe what you're saying, bringing this kind of tool is really important to really proving that point. Because when you're trying to build trust with community, seeing really is believing. In addition, people wanted to use these kind of tools to engage with kids who don't spend a lot of time out in the ocean, yet are really familiar with technology. This is something that's really engaging to a youth that's of a different generation. In addition, you can use it on the other side to engage with elders who might not be, have much familiarity with this technology, but know the ocean really well. Bring in an image of a place that they know really, that they traditionally knew, but they haven't been able to go out in years, is in a way to build that, um, to start a dialogue. Because these elders, kind of like our models from the past, hold this information of what the reef used to look like. Bringing them an image of what it looks like now uh, helps us tap into that knowledge and gives them a way to look into the past and really know about the changes of our reef. The other way that teaching 3D model technology, that teaching 3D model technology to communities can build trust doesn't have to actually do with the science. For these small communities to trust science, the methods, statistics, and results sometimes aren't even as important as who collected it. So the more time I spent with these conservation officers, the better understanding I had of some of the community's social dynamics. And these, and these conversations put, into tr uh, put these aspects of trust into a bigger context. Especially in smaller communities where sometimes there are only a few hundred people and where most people are related to each other. Data collected and presented to a community by the people of that community has a whole extra layer of trust built into it. Ownership and the source of that information is important. So it really matters who is behind this camera taking the photos, even though the model would look the same regardless of who took it. In addition, giving conservation officers some of the cutting edge tools in coral reef science adds to their credibility, giving them a legitimacy that they're doing the same type of science as some of the leading researchers in the world. In this sense, one of the, one of the messages they wanted to highlight with the 3D models is the fact that now they have the capacity to build 3D models. Showing technology, showing this technology to funding sources like um, donors, local government, or in grant proposals can help them acquire resources to further their reef conservation efforts. Collaborations between academics, nonprofits, and communities are an important way to bring technology out of the lab and into management and conservation use. It's important to realize that each community is unique in their needs and that while successful management needs robust science to help us make informed decisions, there are some issues that cannot be addressed by collecting more data or making better analysis. These 3D models have great scientific use, but they also have the potential to address these underlying issues in conservation. By spending time with the groups on the ground, talking with people and listening to some of the challenges that they face, it's possible to build relationships that allow us to share these tools and not only capture great scientific data, but bring this data to the people in interesting and understanding ways that they can trust. I'd like to thank everybody in this, in this photo. I don't have time to name everybody. I, I really would like the name of them, especially my uh, capstone committee, um, Brian Stewart, uh, the people in the lab, all these people sitting right before me, uh, including Samantha Risa and this cohort, uh, all the groups in Palau that took really good care of us when we were there. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without any of these people's help. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Questions? Up in the back. Hey, I just wanted to know how you are planning to continue your relationship with the people in Palau after you're done here. Yeah, so I'm, I, I feel like I spent enough time where I'm actually kind of friends with them now. It's kind of, it was really fun. Um, so I'm, I'm still emailing them. <laughs> I, have, I have some of their WhatsApps. I text them pictures and stuff like that. Um, I, I, so these, uh, keeping these relationships, especially in, in places across the sea, um, that's really important to building these collaborations and making those relationships last is a, a, a component that, is, that really matters because just going into a place, doing the science and then leaving, you know, that, that, that might be good for one side of this equation but not necessarily another side. And I know um, the uh, researchers here also have a, um, are also continu continuing doing research in Palau and want to incorporate those uh, communities in 
with some of the research that they're doing there. So it's, it's, it's planning to be a, a long-term collaboration and have these relationships in the long term. Hi, Bert. Great job. My question has to do with communicating to the community the health of the various protected areas, given that the models you're using, I know a lot of the 3D modeling can't include things like the fish that they're yeah. able to visualize yet. And so for me, I'm wondering, the communities I've worked with have had a tough time seeing just a coral scape and kind of understanding how a healthy coral scape looks when you don't have any of the other components of it. So is that a difficulty that you had to overcome and how did you go about communicating the success of various protected areas and management even though they couldn't see several of the components of the ecosystem through the models? You know, that's a fantastic question and that's one of the, the limitations of this kind of photogrammetry technology is that it doesn't show things that move and like fish, which are a lot of the times uh, a really important part of what people want to protect. Um, so that's why I think grounding it in real images, kind of what I had on the, the, the split screen, not only playing uh, different images of two time points, you know, two models, one from 2017, 2019, but grounding that in the real image, you know, the video fly through so you can see what's around it, see what's in the water, um, and, and put these virtual images into a context of something that's actually in the ocean, rather than just something that lives on a computer. <laughs> 